Hello, it's me, Christine. Welcome to my little crime corner. Is this fun with the sleeves? I feel like we've known each other a long time, and we should take a trip. Our story takes place today in Antwerp, Belgium, in the Diamond District. How exciting that we're here. In a single square mile, it is home to over 80% of the world's diamond business. Over a billion dollars in diamonds are traded there each year. One would assume that because so many valuable assets are traded and moved around on a daily basis, that there has to be top-notch security. And you'd be right. There's armed security, there's cameras on every corner, there's those iron stanchion things that come up out of the ground. By early 2003, there hadn't been a robbery in Antwerp's Diamond District for almost a decade. The World Diamond Center is probably the most secure building in all of the Diamond District, and up until this point, it's actually never been robbed before. Like, no one has even attempted. Because this building in particular had a lot of security features. First, to even get into the building, you would have had to have an electronic key card. Next, you'd have to go through a vault that had a magnetic lock. You would then have to be able to get into the vault by using a four-digit combination that had over a hundred million possibilities, as well as a key that was made up of three different pieces. And on top of this, you'd be watched by security cameras and CCTV the entire time. Two floors below ground was the vault that was originally built in the 1970s and made to be impenetrable. There was no possible way one would just be able to waltz right into this vault without having to go through all of those things that we just mentioned above. No chance. The door to the vault weighed over three tons and was solid steel, which would make attempts such as drilling through the door itself impossible because it would also set off a vibration detector alarm in the process. There was a very thick, very impenetrable magnetic lock that was the size of a brick attached to the top of the door, which matched up to another brick-sized magnet that was bolted to the wall. If this magnetic field was broken, an alarm would sound. On February 17th, 2003, the Antwerp Diamond District wakes up to the shocking news that the World Diamond Center has been robbed. $100 million in diamonds and precious stones, gone. How could this have happened in such a secure building? No alarms were set off. No shots were fired. Not one eyewitness. Literally, who could have done this? I'll tell you who. An Italian man named Leonardo Nota Bartolo. But Christine, how did he do it? He had assembled a crew with the expertise and the experience to pull off what was single-handedly the largest gem heist in history. Wait, 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 wait. I know what you're thinking. How do we know it was him? Well, Leonardo had been planning this robbery for over two years. In 2001, Leonardo had posed as a businessman and rented an office space in the World Diamond Center. He tells people that he has several jewelry stores in Italy and is there to purchase diamonds for said stores. But we know he was there to study the building's layout and security systems. What a plan. When Leonardo had signed his lease for his office in the World Diamond Center, he was given a key card. So he was able to come and go in and out of the building as he pleased, and this didn't raise any suspicion at all, because after all, he was renting an office there, and people assumed that he was or was intent on conducting diamond business there. Okay, he's in, he has access, he has his key card. Now what? The next step is getting in the vault. In order to do this, he had rented a safe deposit box, which were all located in the vault, so he would have reason and access to go into the vault anytime he wanted during normal business hours. In the two years he was there, he had learned the security staff schedule, as well as the comings and goings of other staff in the building. He had watched all of the other renters and learned their routines, 
and had noted all the locations of the security cameras. He had studied the layout of the building and knew the ins and the outs of the vault. Because the vault was designed to be entered with a combination as well as a key, he would be unable to enter the vault by himself, especially not knowing the access combination or having physical possession of the key. So, he studied the security features of the vault and devised a way to get in. He begins going down into the vault during business hours, so he is, of course, accompanied by a guard. He uses a tiny camera disguised as a pen and is able to take pictures and videos of every inch of the vault. He took lots of video footage that he then poured over to spot his way in. Once inside the first door of the vault, there are sensors that detect light, motion, and body heat. Remember, he is not working alone. He has a whole team of criminals back home in Italy that he confers with every month. Together, they go over all the photos and the videos, as well as notes that Leonardo has taken and continue to devise their plan. The rest of the team tells Leonardo what they need next in order to move on to the next step. They send him a list of things that they need filmed or photographed, and Leonardo then returns to Antwerp to gather it. The crew he had assembled consists of an alarm specialist who knew everything there is to know about alarms, as well as how to disable various alarms. One person's day job was a locksmith, so he knew everything about keys and specific keys that open different things. And remember, Leonardo is an experienced thief. This isn't his first rodeo. So he has all of his experts assembled. Now they need to break in. Once they're in the building, they will need to break into the vault. They have to somehow guess the combination to the lock, somehow get through the magnetic sensors, somehow pass through the infrared detector, somehow sneak past the motion detector, and somehow slip past the light detector. Easy. Assuming they get past all of this, they are in the vault, surrounded by safe deposit boxes that they then have to open one by one by one by one by one, remove the contents, then exit the building, all without triggering any alarms. Remember, Leonardo has been planning this and only this for the last two years. He probably has an idea or two about how to get past all of these security obstacles. Leonardo and company specifically chose to orchestrate the robbery on Valentine's Day weekend because they knew the Diamond District would be empty. So, as it turns out, even though the CCTV cameras were rolling during the weekends, nobody was actually there to monitor them. They would be able to enter and exit the building, and even though they would be on film, they would not be seen immediately. The security in place in the building was assumed to be so secure that they didn't seem to be too concerned about the comings and goings, not during business hours. After all, getting into the vault was... impossible. Leonardo and three of his accomplices were able to enter the World Diamond Center complex through a side garage door. They drove in with a garage door opener that they had made beforehand and parked. Okay, so they're in. The next order of business is getting past the vault door. So remember the multi-part key that was needed? The long piece and the small stamp piece were supposed to be and usually stored separately, but for some reason this weekend, that protocol was not followed. The key components were kept in a small lockbox in a room off to the side of the vault door. Leonardo and company were easily able to pry open the lockbox with a crowbar, retrieving both parts of the key. Next up, they needed the locks combination. The combination was a four-digit code that had numbers ranging from 0 to 99, meaning that there are a hundred choices for each number. 100 million possibilities. The numbers weren't on the side like a typical combination lock, 
you would have actually had to look down on the little window concealing the numbers. You would only be able to see the numbers by looking directly down onto the numbers. Because the glass covering the combination acted as a distorted lens, so you wouldn't have been able to see the numbers if you were looking at them from any other angle than directly over top. This was done so the building security guard would have been able to open the safe while having other tenants or other people in the building around him in the vault, but not actually seeing the combination, so it would be more secure for him to take people in and out without having them know how to get in themselves. In other words, it would be very obvious if you were peering over someone's shoulder to try to see the combination. It was too risky to try to get it that way, even with his little spy pin camera. So Leonardo and his crew were somehow able to just guess the combination because there was no way to break into this part in particular without having the combination. This was the most perplexing factor to police because they were like, how were they able to guess this? The only thing I can think of is he was able to somehow get it from someone or steal it from someone in the building, but that's taking into consideration that it's written down somewhere. But in a situation where we are in such a secure building, I find that hard to believe, although not completely out of the realm of possibilities. I don't know. So he actually gets the combination right, but that doesn't do him any good if the door's magnetic sensors break. Remember, the door to the vault has a brick-sized magnet that is matched up with another brick-sized magnet attached to the wall. Breaking the magnetic seal will set off alarms. So what do they do? They end up attaching a specially designed metal plate to one of the magnets, unscrew the magnets from the magnet on the door, leaving it still magnetically attached to the magnet on the wall, and the vault door opens. Because the magnetic seal on the wall and the vault door never broke, the alarm never went off. Hold on, we're not inside yet. When entering through the vault, there were three separate security features that would each need to be disarmed. Remember before when I mentioned the motion detector, light detector, and infrared light detector? Before entering, Leonardo and crew turned off all the lights. Seems simple and slowly make their way to disarm each alarm. There is a circular motion detector on the ceiling that is able to capture both infrared and Doppler activity. Infrared basically detects heat energy, which would detect a human body that wouldn't necessarily be detected on the other sensors. The infrared detector can see electromagnetic radiation so if there was a person in range of the detector, the heat from their body would be picked up by the detector, even if they were not visible from the camera. Doppler would detect motion via its emitted microwaves, which are waves that bounce off of surfaces. It creates a pattern and maps a room based off that pattern of the microwaves bouncing off the wall and any other items in the room, like furniture, so it knows where the walls are, and if there's anything in between the origin of the sensor and the walls, say a person moving through this room, this would trigger the alarm. Both the infrared and Doppler detectors would have to go off in order to trigger the alarm. If only one of them goes off, it would be considered a false alarm or a malfunction. So how were they able to get past this sensor? Several days prior, Leonardo had entered the vault during business hours and waited for other people to leave, and once everyone was gone, he sprayed the infrared detector with hairspray, and this created a film over the sensor, which made it much less sensitive to body heat. This goes unnoticed because it's hairspray, and hairspray is clear. Next, in order to block the Doppler detector in the same device, they actually brought along with them a small styrofoam block with a circle cut out and just put it over the sensor. They had attached the styrofoam block to a long pole that they also brought along and slowly inched it up towards the ceiling where they secured it over the detector. 
The styrofoam acts as an insulator and they were able to completely conceal themselves from the Doppler detector by muffling the radar waves. They then went on to disarm the motion detector in the most sophisticated way. They put a piece of tape over the sensor. <coughs> sophisticated. Okay, so they disarmed all the alarms, right? Moment of truth. Let's turn on the light. No alarm goes off. They are in the clear. Once in the vault, they see all the safe deposit boxes on the other side. Remember, we're in the Diamond Center. Obviously. And most of the boxes belong to other tenants in the building, who are mostly diamond traders, so you can imagine what is inside the boxes. It's diamonds. Because Leonardo had been in and out of the vault several times, he knew that once in, they wouldn't be able to just pry open the safes one by one. This would take far too much time, especially since they were potentially at constant risk of being caught. Based on the surveillance that Leonardo had collected in the months leading up to the heist, his team had built a device that would allow them to open all the safe deposit boxes quickly and efficiently. They had built an E-shaped metal bar that they then attached to the box. From there, they would force the middle bar with a twisting motion and pop the actual lock mechanism on the back, immediately opening the box. They began opening the boxes one by one, giving way to insurmountable treasure. Because of the time crunch they were under, and the fact that they had committed to only taking one trip, taking a second trip would only increase the risk of being caught, they had to rifle through the gyms quickly and make split decisions about what to take and what to leave behind. They take what they think are the most valuable gems, totaling over $100 million. Based on the mess they left, Leonardo and his team opened over 100 safe deposit boxes. They made it out during the night, completely off the radar. When police made the discovery the next day, the vault was just total chaos. They became frantic, obviously, because no obvious clues were left at the scene. They call forensics to determine exactly how these thieves were able to break in to this thought-to-be impenetrable vault. They basically clear out the whole building and dust the entire place, looking for fingerprints, palm prints, footprints, animal prints. We are basically looking for prints of any kind. They know they need to work quickly because it's pretty easy to get in and out of other European countries, and they don't know where the thieves could be headed next. They are also carrying millions in diamonds, which are easy to carry and equally as easy to sell. They're thinking that the thieves might get away with it. Police dust and come up with nothing. They are stunted. Based on how well planned out this entire heist was, and the fact that they seem to have planned for everything, one would assume that they already have a plan as to where they're going to go to sell off the gems. Police then get a massive clue about 25 miles away off the highway in a forest in between the area of Antwerp and Brussels. A man named August Van Camp would regularly patrol this wooded area for litter, would go through it and determined who had left it there, and then would go to the police with the information. During one of August's regular patrols, he comes across several bags of trash. He said it was unlike any trash he had ever seen before. Isn't it always? While going through the trash, August found a lot of paperwork that was specific to the Diamond District, which was peculiar since it was pretty far away from this small farm town. August then called local police, who, for once, were happy to receive his call. While going through the litter, police discover that some of it had come directly from the World Diamond Center, the very place that the heist took place. One of the pieces of paper found was torn up in little pieces and resembled a correspondence between an alarm specialist in Turin, Italy, and a tenant of the World Diamond Center 
named Leonardo Notarbartolo. Also in the trash was a half-eaten salami sandwich that police were able to test for DNA. Finally, they have a name. They have something. Belgian police have never heard of him before, but they have something to go on, and they pursue this. Upon investigation, police learn that Leonardo Notar Bartolo had been a tenant of the World Diamond Center for two years, although he had never made a transaction in all of his time there, and he was frequently out of his rented, empty office, only coming in a few times a month, and often going down into the vault, despite not having anything in a safe deposit box down there. You think they would have seen this coming. Belgian police learned that he was a known criminal in his hometown Turin, Italy, as well as across Europe. 36 hours after the heist, Leonardo and company have no idea the police are onto them. He had no idea he left mountains of evidence in the woods, directly connecting him to the crime. If they had dumped their trash in, literally, any other area in Europe, or, I don't know, maybe not litter at all, they would have been fine. Although police are on to Leonardo and his crew, they do not have enough to arrest him and put him in jail. At least, not yet. The Italian police then visit his home in Turin, but he's not there, and there aren't any clues as to where he might be. They then open his home safe and find 17 diamonds. 16 of those diamonds, however, are impossible to trace, either due to their size or cut. But the 17th diamond was noticeably very large. It was a 7 carat diamond housed in a protective security device called a blister pack, and it had a chip on the case that was serial numbered, which connected it to a list of diamonds that ended up being stolen during the heist. This single diamond tied Leonardo directly to the robbery. What do you do to look innocent and throw police off your trail? Seriously, what would you do? Would you go into hiding? Would you change your appearance? Certainly you wouldn't go back to the scene of the crime, right? Well, that's exactly what Leonardo did. A few days after the heist, he returns to the World Diamond Center. In his mind, this would take suspicion off of him. He didn't want to be the only tenant that didn't return after the robbery. He's trying his best not to act suspicious, but little does he know, they are already very suspicious of him, and he's the lead suspect. They are closing in. The other people inside the World Diamond Center talk to him and delay him for a while, while the police are already on their way. The police show up and arrest him. Once in custody, police are able to match his DNA to the half-eaten salami sandwich. Along with the receipt for the sandwich found among the trash, there was also security footage from a nearby grocery store showing Leonardo buying the sandwich. With all the other evidence in the trash found, they have enough to arrest the rest of his crew. Unfortunately, although the crew was arrested, hardly any of the stolen diamonds were ever recovered. On May 19th, 2005, Two years after the heist, Leonardo Notar Bartolo was convicted of orchestrating and participating in the robbery and was sentenced to 10 years in prison in Belgium and ordered to pay over $1 million in damages. The four other members of his crew were also convicted and were each sentenced to five years in prison and they all had to pay huge fines. The other members of the crew were not named but Leonardo did give aliases for them in interviews. There was Speedy, who was responsible for leaving the trash in the woods, so they can all thank this guy for getting caught. Thanks, Speedy. There was the monster, who was the lockpicker, electrician, and getaway driver. There was the genius, who was the alarm specialist, who was known to be an electronics expert and was linked to several robberies. And there was the King of Keys, who was described as one of the best key forgers in the world. He was the only member of the crew to remain unknown by police, 
and for this reason was able to avoid being caught and charged. Although sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2005, he was released on parole in 2009. In 2011, there was a warrant issued out against him for violating his parole conditions. One of the conditions was that he was to compensate the victims of the World Diamond Center heist, which he never did or made any attempt. Because of this, he was again arrested in 2013 at an airport in Paris during a layover, traveling from the United States back to his home in Turin, Italy. He was made to serve the remainder of his sentence until his release in 2017. While in prison, Leonardo was described as being a model prisoner. He actually cooked a lot of Italian food in his cell. Like, why would they allow that? He continued to claim that he was broke in order to get out of paying the hefty restitution fines. So he was broke, but he somehow had enough money to spend 3,000 euros a month on phone bills. Like, literally, who are you calling? Leonardo gave an interview to Wired magazine and claimed that a merchant in the World Diamond Center had contracted him to carry out the heist for insurance purposes. He said that they stole $20 million worth of diamonds and gems, and the purpose of the robbery was insurance fraud. However, due to the fact that the vault itself was uninsured, most likely since everything in the vault was owned by individuals who had their own insurance policy on what was in their boxes, and it's not the vault's responsibility if anything gets stolen, since they are providing a service, such as if you had a storage unit and put your own lock on it, and only you had the key or combination, and if someone breaks in, the storage facility is not at fault, because they only provided the space and the promised level of security. Because the vault had such a high level of promised security, one would assume that they would be safe from any robbery. Never assume anything. You know what they say when you assume. Anyway, because of this lack of blanket insurance, if you will, pretty much everyone involved doubted his claims. Luckily, the security at the World Diamond Center, as well as the Diamond District in general, has greatly increased since the heist. Everything down to the CCTV footage being stored off-site, to impenetrable magnetic seals securing the vaults. So, be careful and discerning where you keep your things, namely your diamonds, insure them, keep them secret, keep them safe. And that is all I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned something, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!